for the most part, it's mostly centered on the education system and the, the four new junior high, uh, ju- junior high actors. The, the um, and then, but I, but uh, sorry, you, you, you know, you, you call and you text people when you actually got shit done, and then they want to talk to you when you're recording. <laughs> You doing a podcast? Let's talk. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, kind of. When I didn't pick up the phone call, that should have been a clue. Um, anyway, so but I, I wanted to get so I wanted to get your kind of general thoughts about season four, and then I have a very specific question for you. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I I mean, again, like you said, it's a focus on the struggles of the education mm-hmm. system with the inner city youth and. Mm-hmm. I have never, ever, not one bit wanted to be a teacher after watching this show. <laughs> no. Yeah. No I, way. I, I mean, I, I know that your wife teaches and has had situ. Well, I mean, I don't know if it was as like this or not, but something mm-hmm. at least close to it. Uh, you've mentioned that before on previous podcasts. And I mean, yeah, she's, worked title, she's worked in Title Nine and while she works in a school now that's in one of the high end parts of Tampa, it it has because of the way things are drawn, also because of school choice, also because we have a high immigrant population, because there's a local university nearby that attracts a lot of foreigners. It's a wide mix, and she definitely deals with a lot of the socialization issues this season speaks to in the students. Right. Right. And what you and see she, in this, she, hang on, she's had to make some DC, DCF phone calls. Like really? there, there have absolutely been kids that have been Baker acted out of that school. Oh yeah. There's a lot of mental health issues. Oh. Kids have had to have been in Florida. It's called the Baker act. It's a forcible uh, inpatient hospitalization for children. You know, I mean the Baker act exists for everybody, but in this particular case, they've had to have kids Baker acted out of the school and Man. brought to a community mental health center. Um Ugh. You've got single parent homes, you've got drugs, you've got all kinds, you know, she's absolutely called me at work. But can you tell me if this kid's parent is in, j- is in jail? <laughs> and I, I, as long as I'm not going through their medical record, I'm not breaking any rules because we have a right. I mean, she could have easily done this herself. There's right. a public, there's a public website that tells you who's in jail. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's it, what we see in this season, though, is, yeah, we get to see the struggles, but we also get to see somebody, mainly Bunny Colvin, trying to take an action in order to change the yes. situation, much like he did in the previous season by mm-hmm. uh, Hampstead Dam. But this here is him at least trying to work within the system to better these kids. And what right. you start to realize is that you know, our the way the system is set up is not meant to make these kids succeed. It's make it's to make the system succeed. Yes, it's to make the school succeed, and that's what's sad. But go I think ahead. thematic. Well, I think thematically, that's that's just the wire, though. You right. Know, if you look at right, if you I don't want to get too far ahead, but if you look at a lot of the stuff with Carcetti, um, so this season he becomes he wins the primary, and then it's just assumed he's going to be he's going to be the mayor, mayor he's elect. Gonna, yep. Yeah, he's mayor elect. So by the end of the season, he is, <clears throat> he is firmly in the mayor's seat, and he is doing mayor things. And the cliffhanger is he's got a $54 million deficit from the schools yeah. that nobody wants to claim that he has to deal with. If he's promised the sun, the moon, and the stars to the police and public works and all kinds of stuff. So uh, that's where we're going to pick up season five next month. But in the meantime, um, one of the things that occurs, the... the the, the school budget deficit thing is a really great like microcosm of what you're talking about in the sense of systems are designed for the system to succeed. The people in the system can fuck off. Right. You know, <laughs> but it is definitely designed to keep the system running the way that, you know, the way that it's going. And so you have the situation with this $54 million deficit and they're basically, and he's told go to the governor beg and you beg, for, beg for the money. But if you do that, you're going to look like shit two years from now when you try to run for governor. Yeah. Yeah. And you're sad. Ultimately. Yourself. Yeah. And ultimately he fucks the kids and the whole city to protect his political career. Right. Right. Yeah. Like nobody, it's nobody just does the right thing because it's the right thing to do. 
you know, right. it's a, the governor that he's going to is going to make him suffer and pay for it because he sees him coming. So this is an advantage to take it out of his ass instead of just giving him the money because we don't want your city schools to fail. <laughs> you know, things like right. that. Teach them the test. Teach yeah. them the test. It's like, why? They're not learning anything. You're just teaching them the test itself, how to pass the test. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when I was watching this the first round and, and going, how can these people feel like they are doing anything? And that's pretty much what Presbo and Presbolewski, I'm calling him Presbo. Um, Presbolewski. You know, Mr. <laughs> that's pretty much what Pres Mr. Presbolewski ends up uh, understanding is that, you know, he isn't doing anything in order to make these kids learn something that's useful and it's and you know there's very there's a great moment where he starts to realize what can i do to make them learn and that is to use what he wants to teach them and apply it to their world right uh they so, start shooting it, dice and, and through dice he's able to teach them probability right right but yeah man you, you just it, as much as this show is about drugs take a shot every time someone mentions a number <laughs> that's when you're going to be in the hospital because there it is everything is numbers driven in this city oh my, my god stats, <laughs> there, my, there's a scene where carcetti's addressing the west side uh roll call and even like one of like the old like like narcotics detectives it's just like it's the fucking numbers game man you know right dude um right. there's there's a whole conversation that takes place between Prez Belusky and uh cuddy's ex-girlfriend who's who's a teacher where you know and she's you now she's now switched from whatever county school she was at in season three she's come over to the school you know so they basically just wanted to keep this character around yeah. so they moved her into the same city school that Pre that Pres Belusky's teaching in <clears throat> it's kind of like a mentor character to him and um he's she's explaining things to him and he goes oh you're juking the stats juking the stats she's like, baby she's like what she's like <laughs> He's like, we have a we have this you know way of turning rapes, making rapes go away, turning burglaries into this, and you know re everything getting reduced. So it's not a real reflection of the crime rate. It is massaged to make it yeah. look better than it really is. Yeah. Um, my question is in the education system, which here's the thing: I've been in. I don't know if you felt differently because you're a business graduate. Um, you have a business degree, and you've been working in unemployment for the vast majority of your career. So I don't know if you think about this the same way that I do, but I've been a social worker since the year of our Lord 2000. <laughs> so 22 years. Mm -hmm. In that time, I have a graduate degree, my license, everything else. I've worked with kids. I've worked with families. I've worked in the uh, correctional system with, uh, you know, with drug addicts and whatnot. And I've all, it, the problem with this was in what year was this? Uh, this was 2006. 2006. So I've been in the social service field for six years. I, I, I all, and I was a teacher before that. I was a teacher in 1999 in the Los Angeles public school system. In fact, I taught in the junior high that fed into the high school that Stan and Delivered was said to have taken place. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, I heard some stories about that teacher, by the way. In any case, like I already fucking knew all this. I, I knew kids in inner cities had shit situations. I knew that there was mental health problems. Like this, the thing about seasons one, two, and three is they're talking about stuff that is interesting to me that I would want to watch a television show about but and that I may not have already known. Season four is like, let's tell you how bad the education is. I fucking know already. I know. I have worked with these children. Okay. The, Duquan. Michael, Naaman, and Randy, who are the stars of season four, and then to a lesser degree, my favorite character in this entire season, Canard. Um, <laughs> they kick my door in, David. That's how they do. You're this big. <laughs> this is how big Canard is. Oh my gosh. He um, gets beat. Oh yeah, Michael whoops his ass. <laughs> um, so a lot of this season is just like following those kids around, watching them in school. They separate Naaman out and they put him in the special class with the rest of the sweat hogs it, following that. Um, and then they're in the street. They're fucking with this one evil cop, Walker. Uh, you see their home lives. There's a lot about Michael and then his, you know, and his brother's father who comes home who clearly molested Michael at mm. one point. Randy and his foster mother. 
Um, you don't get to see much of Duquan's home life, but Duquan's home life is essentially he lives with hardcore drug addicts. It's not, yeah, it's not good. Right. And then, you know, you spend some time with Donut. You spend some time with Canard. You spend some time with Sherrod. Can I tell you every Sherrod bubble scene I just fast forward through? Oh, I have so oh. the least amount of interest in the entire bubble story with the other Poor homeless bubs. drug addict. Poor just, bubs. I mean, it's sad what happens just for the for the record. He, you know, he makes a hot shot to kill this guy that's been bullying him and Kinar and um, Sherrod smokes it yeah. and kills himself. Up, kills him. Yeah. Right. And so uh, Bubs turns himself into the homicide unit and tries to hang himself in the interrogation room and ends up at the end in the psychiatric facility. Which that genuinely makes me sad. When um, when uh, what's his face? Uh, I can't remember the character's name. But he's played by a musician. Tom Waits uh, goes to see him at the very end. And oh Bob, yeah, that's br- that was tough, man. And yeah, Bob just falls to fuck the pieces. And that's uh, that's brutal. Yeah, he's just staring off, and then as soon as he sees somebody that he recognizes, mm-hmm. he's just so filled with shame, and and he just breaks down. Right, man. So. I'm going to let you go ahead and jump in on this, but as much the the individual actors give ex- extremely good performances, their stories are very sad, and it's just like the wire to reward the least worthy child with the best life. <laughs> Naaman, Naaman Bryce is is Weebay's son. Weebay we took all them murders for sandwich, <laughs> for potato sandwich. Of, what was it for? Fucking pita sandwich and some potato chips. Speaking of not pronouncing words correctly. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Peter said with some tater chips, I'll go a few more. That's not even English. Um, but <laughs> good old Weebay. So, yeah, Naaman Bryce is Weebay's son. And because the Avon Barksdale organization has pretty much dried up and all the money with it, yeah, it's all uh, has, hey, he, Naaman has to go out in the streets and start selling drugs because that's what his mother expects him to do because she's the worst. And, um, boy, is she. And by the end of the season, he realizes, hey, I don't want to be a drug dealer anymore. Hey, I don't want to be a criminal. Hey, I'm not hard. You know, I, I, I bully the one kid that I can bully because I'm too afraid to actually, you know, I, I have a big mouth and no bite. And, right. and because throughout all of that, he's developed this relationship with um, Bunny. Bunny ends up adopting him. Right. The Not Michael, who was molested. Not Randy, who to get out of a possible assisted rape charge, you know, confesses to being a part of a murder. Um, Almost he, adopted by another cop. Another cop tried to adopt he tried, him. Yeah, Car- he tried. Carver tried to. Um, but no, ends up in a, getting beat to shit in a foster, in a group home. He got and that then, snitch then, put on him. He, yeah, he got the, mm-hmm. the, the word and, snitch is attached and to him. And who was the most, who was the most needing of all, the most worthy of all to have been taken care of by any one of the functional adults on this show ends up living with Michael. Because right. At least Michael like, treats him right, you know, and, and he, that's that's the good thing. It's kind of like a big brother to him. And it's it's just such a wire you know, thing. Like of these four children, who should win the grand prize and be adopted by Bunny Colvin? How about the asshole? The worst. The worst child. The kid that ch- uh, the kid that changed the most? I don't know. I I I mean look a lot of this season is chartering the journey of these kids who right you know our first so episode hang on. if you don't buy if you're not if you don't have buy-in with the kid stories if this is a chore to get through that's my whole yes point. right right yeah i mean you're watching these kids go from a real tight-knit group of mm-hmm. friends and by the end of this you know carver's walking past where these kids used to hang and whatever the name of their you know their little group was was spray painted on the wall it's but it's not mafia. there anymore it, yeah what was it I want something it was like mafia fayette, it was like fayette street mafia or some shit right right but by the by the time this just one you know one year of school is over mm-hmm. everything has changed for these kids and i think that's probably what they're trying to detail here in this season is that you know these kids they grow up they have friends, and because of the way the streets are, in a single year, everything can change. Bodie, everything. Be, right before Bodie is killed for talking to McNulty, he talks about that he's been in the streets since he was 13. Yeah. I think he's like 15 or 16 in season one. So by the time we get to season four, he's probably around 20 years old. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, like the one time, the one or two times he gets popped between seasons one and three, he talks about going to like, you know, baby booking and juvenile hall or whatever, you know, boys village. I think it's, I want to say it's either season one or season two where he escapes boys village and limps home. Yeah. <laughs> he's just like, he's grabbing a mop and then he's just walking out of the door. Yep. Um, <laughs> but I think just to kind of, we want to talk about sort of the, the, the problem with the, we touched on it before what they're talking about with the education system is essentially the social family system in Baltimore is broken. Car uh, Colvin Bunny says uh, something about the stoop kids and there's corner kids. Stoop kids. <coughs> stoop kids. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> stoop kids will more or less do what they're told. They'll do their work. They'll come to school. They aren't going to cause problems. Corner kids will make learning for the for the stoop kids almost impossible. Right, right. So the whole problem, the whole program that he gets proposed, uh, the whole thing that is, he meets a doctoral social worker, and they have this grant money to deal with um, socializing kids to try to get them off the path of destruction. And it's funny because originally he's like, we're talking 18 to 21 year olds. And so they talked to one of them in the interrogation room. <laughs> he's like, wait a second. We could go younger. <laughs> After well, that think, guy basically yeah. is throws something at him and about grabs and shoves a pin up his ass. What it, What is so funny is that is that throughout that questioning where they're just like, let's say something happened to your sister. What happened to my sister? No, let's yeah. say, why are you talking about my sister? Here's the thing. I, I've experienced that level of dumb uh... every day. I can't tell you how many people I talk to that are that level of dumb, oh, you know, man. or like when Prez is, ta is talking to junior high kids, he's talking to eighth graders, and he's like, okay, we're going to distribute. What distribute mean? Give out. Why don't you just say give out? Um, I think when he's, he's, there was something about like being married and like one of the kids just can't get off of it. And it's like, why are you, why, why are you married? Like to have intimacy. Right. Ooh, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, calm down, calm down now. Right, I and... absolutely experienced that level of dumb. Jeez, please. So I think as much as I enjoy the performances, and I un, and I am sympathetic towards the storylines, I just struggle with this season because between the the not having a central case that they're focused on, and not having a, th a theme that I'm particularly interested in at this point because it's too little too close to home for me more so than anything else in the wire uh I don't love this season um yeah I talked to, I talked about how Bunny Colvin probably made his way up the ladder for me as as far as hero goes on mm -hmm. the wire uh last year was great this year I I mean I understood what he wanted to do this is a man who wanted to take uh and make some type of a change in the school system, mm -hmm. even though he wasn't, he wasn't really interested in it at first. We, we first see him being, he's a hotel security guard. Um, Cause he's no longer working for the police, but you know, he gets involved with the academic who he finally gets to, he finally understands what this guy wants to do mm -hmm. and, uh, and then gets involved in the school and to watch him go to we Bay, mm -hmm. you know, that takes, it takes some, gumption i guess is the best Let's word just go yeah. the word you're looking for there you go to go and talk to a convicted drug dealer a convicted murderer 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 murderer, murderer serving say, hey. multiple life sentences who took extra murders for a pita sandwich and some tater chips <laughs> your son can he come mm -hmm. and live with a former cop <laughs> I, <laughs> I would like to hi you don't know me but i taught your son for two months and i would right. now like to adopt him that just shows you that <laughs> the level of understanding that Bunny Colvin mm -hmm. has, number one, for the people that were on the streets and their role. You know, mm -hmm. he was a cop. He was, you know, and uh, he was beating on drug dealers, I'm sure. Uh, you know, and oh, but growing up on those corners. I used, to beat on your, I used to beat on your boys, you know, when he's going through, he's going through like, what, you know, what Baltimore was like back when they were both young. <clears throat> right. I was like, oh, I used to beat up on I used to beat up on you and your boys on the corner. Um, you know, when we were, when we would sweep corners. And then he has that one line, like, what time did Tate a man come out to club? Right. 
Oh and yeah, that... knows exa- none of the rest of the universe knows the fuck he's talking about. But we <laughs> knew. <laughs> Who the fuck uh, is Tanner, man? Um, fucking, t- I, if I remember right, Kima on her first homicide or the first body she went to go see. They're Tanner like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> check the hand, check the hand. He's got a little rolled up piece of paper in there. Mm-hmm. It says Tater did it. In the other hand, Bunk's <laughs> like the other hand's got his phone number. 